This week on Waterways. Mangrove water snakes and the National Weather Service in Key West. the word lagoon, one might imagine ukuleles, swaying palms in the South Pacific. But you might be surprised to learn that at the tip of the Florida Peninsula lies one of the United States' largest lagoons, Florida Bay. What makes Florida Bay a lagoon is the network of shallow mud and grass banks that crisscross its interior. These banks are both a blessing and a challenge for the bay's animals. In good times, the banks teem with fish, shrimp, crabs, and mollusks. In dry times, the banks isolate parts of the bay into separate little ponds that can become twice as salty as seawater, a harsh environment for many creatures. Teasing the secrets of life and death from the bay's animals requires patience and the knack for looking in unexpected places. It requires you to follow your curiosity and scientific hunches wherever they might lead. Brian Mealy of the Institute of Wildlife Sciences has been doing this for more than 10 years. Brian started studying bald eagles and osprey in Florida Bay in 1992, but his study of eagles soon led him to another animal. In many of the eagle nests, he found a curious turtle shell. Tracking the shells to their source, he located the first known population of diamondback terrapins in Florida Bay. It's funny how all the projects here that we do out in the bay, have, one has led to the other. And I guess anytime you do research, you have idle time. And idle time to me is, like a lot of people, sometimes wasteful time. So when you're out there, if you're looking for multiple species, you can get a lot more accomplished. You can accumulate data on several species of animals. And hopefully all these animals will be telling you something about the bay. The diamondback terrapins, upon which eagles prey, live in the harsh northeast section of Florida Bay. Mealy thought he could get a better picture of how the terrapins survive if he studied other reptiles that make a habitat in the same place. The mangrove salt marsh snake was just such an animal. Basically in 97 we started with the mangrove salt marsh snakes and we try to we usually try to combine the trips, so if I'm, it's a long trip for a lot of us down here. So if we come down here, we'll come in late in the afternoon, do some diamondback terrapin work, wait until the dark hours, then go out at the same time and do some mangrove salt marsh snakes. By studying the snake, terrapin, bald eagle, and osprey together, Mealy is convinced he can learn much more than studying just one animal in isolation. There's different ways of looking at the science data that we're collecting. This is one species, and that's probably the, the linear approach to science. And, but when you start adding this species with the diamondback terrapin, what do they have in common? What are the differences? Add that species of the diamondback rattlesnake. Commonalities, what's not so common? Ospreys, eagles. When you start putting all this data together, you start increasing the complexity of the project. And how do we decipher the complexity of all these species if they're healthy out there as an indicator for the health of Florida Bay? Tonight, Brian and his team are after the mangrove water snake. Twice a month, they head out from Key Largo as the sun is setting to hunt the elusive snake as it emerges to feed. Finding snakes means seeing the world through their eyes, seeing the movement of their prey and the location of their perches. How big? Uh, I think Again, this is a pretty cool thing about this snake. Its scientific name is Nerodia clockii compressor calda. Compressor calda is a neat name because it's basically a compressed tail. And if you go back in here and look at the posterior part of this animal, it has like a flattened tail right here. And that basically helps it maneuver and swim a lot better in the water than a lot of, uh, let's say, land-based snake, terrestrial snakes. So the slightly compressed tail is like a little rudder that when he moves it helps him swim around. The mangrove water snake often depends upon the rise and fall of water 
to trap its prey. As ponds in this mangrove key dry down late in the season, fish will get stranded. The snake hears them splashing in distress and slides over to take a meal. Seeing these patterns in the snake's life requires patience. By tracking the animals year-round, Mealy sees the ups and downs of the snake's year, something he wouldn't get from a single visit. The snake right in here, right where my light is at. I'm pointing my finger right to the head area. And he is moving, so I'm gonna have to try to grab him pretty soon. Can you see him? Oh, he's a little darker brown, probably. More brownish on this animal than the uh, other animal. You can see how they just intertwine into the nematophores. Great blend. And uh, they move fast enough and slick enough by going around these nematophores, very easy to confuse the eye. Making it a little more difficult to catch him. You can see he's sticking his head up right now. Wondering what was this light? I thought it was, he thought it was sunset, but uh, I'll try to reach in and grab him if I can. This one is a little bigger. After a few hours of searching and with a few snakes in the bag, the team returns to their processing station to take measurements. Their first step is to scan the snake to see if it's been captured before. If the scanner beeps twice, it means the snake has been captured before and a microchip called a pit tag has already been placed into the snake. One beep means the snake is a new animal. Brian and his team will inject previously unmarked animals with a pit tag the size of a grain of rice. The tags will allow Brian to track the animal in future visits. I guess what we do is kind of pinch it up a little bit. And the little pit tag is right in here. So the bevel is always up, right underneath the body, right underneath the skin right here. Checking it. And right now what I do is kind of massage it in there. After recording the snake's measurements, Mealy and his team take blood samples. Later, in the lab, technicians will extract DNA from these samples. The DNA will tell the team how closely related the captured snakes are to each other and might tell them whether the population is diverse enough to be genetically healthy. Mealy's team then takes some additional blood to measure mercury in the animal's body. The part of Florida Bay that Mealy studies is a hot spot for mercury. Well, we're finding that all the species that we analyze, they have mercury in them. There's a percentage of, you know, it's parts per billion or parts per million in their system. The question is, what is it doing to the animal if it's doing anything to the animal? And that's one of the big things that it seems to be um, the enigma of science is what does mercury really do? The world knows what mercury can do to people. Children exposed to the heavy metal suffer learning disabilities. We know less about how mercury moves through the environment and what it does to animals. By studying water snakes, terrapins, eagles, and osprey, Mealy is getting a glimpse of how it might move through Florida Bay's food chains, from fish to turtles to eagles. Now that we're done, time to return them basically to the general vicinity where we originally captured these animals from. So this is the smaller one that Ezekiel found right here. So we're basically going to be just putting it back into the mangroves. Hopefully within five minutes we'll even know what happens. The snake crawls away. Mealy will be back again later in the month. Who knows where his curiosity will guide him next. Doing science like this, following every lead, might seem unfocused, but the truth is, it often leads to important findings. We're just hoping to, by collaborating with the National Park Service, with Fish and Wildlife Service, Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission, by working with government officials, show them that we are uh, an entity that's highly interested in, in the betterment of the system out here, and that we're out here to help them and not be our own little uh, showboat. And that's what we're trying to stress to them all the time we talk. It's all part of a team. So we just want to be part of their team. If 
If you live in the Keys and you spend time on the water, you've probably heard the voice. Or in Middle Keys, including Key West End Marathon. This voice is a product of the National Weather Service, an arm of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and this voice has saved the Keys millions of dollars and thousands of lives. What we're really here for is to protect life and property, and that is our main mission. In fact, when everything gets really bad, we drop everything else and do nothing except issue severe thunderstorm, tornado, or marine warnings. And Believe it or not, the Weather Service does such a good job that survey after survey, national surveys, rank us as the number one most popular government agency. In the Florida Keys and in South Florida, people's livelihoods are directly tied to the weather. In the old days, before satellites and Doppler radar, mariners would rely on folklore, wind direction, and visual guesstimates to determine impending weather conditions. Rules of thumb, like red sky in the morning, sailor's warning, were the only guidance available to mariners, which may be why there are so many shipwrecks off the Florida Keys. With the advent of modern weather technology came the increased ability for those who make a living on the water to succeed in their business. I have some friends down here that run a charter boat operation and, and you asked about how does it affect the locals, how does our job affect the locals. And yeah, I can tell you if we forecast bad weather and they cancel a trip, it'll cost them you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars. And there are hundreds if not thousands just similar mom and pop charter boat operations down here and we could blow a forecast the difference is only like five miles an hour or five knots of wind or maybe even wind direction affects where they take that charter trip to so unlike back in Ohio here if we're wrong we're gonna cost a lot of people a lot of money and if we're really wrong we're, we may cost people's lives because it's not safe to be out there when the waves are too high the National Weather Service is comprised of many branch offices. The office in Key West is a weather forecast office responsible for forecasting weather for the local area. The Key West office has a staff of 21 people, which includes 13 forecasters, three of whom are certified meteorologists. We offer really three basic types of forecasts. And we offer a, a forecast for the land areas that'll have your highs, lows, chance of precipitation, and then a forecast for the marine areas, which will give you your wave heights. And then we also forecast, believe it or not, for the aviation community. Uh, we forecast for the Marathon Airport and the Key West Airport, and that's visibility and, and uh, ceiling height, uh, height of the clouds, and wind, which is important. The staff at Key West National Weather Service Station updates the marine forecast at least four times a day more often if the weather is rapidly changing. You first have to forecast the wind because the mariners are really interested in the waves. And so we look at the wind and, and look at the pressure pattern and forecast the wind. And then from the wind you can guess what the waves are going to be. And there's actually a lot of research into that. Uh, formulas that go into predicting how high the waves can get based on how long the fetch of wind is, how far did it travel across the water, uh, uninterrupted and how high the wind is. The difficulty in predicting and reporting the marine forecast is due to the lack of sensors on the open water. The territory covered by the Key West Weather Service is the largest open water territory covered by any office in the United States. From Ocean Reef to the Tortugas, east to west, and about 60 miles from north to south. And in that whole area, we don't have anything that tells us what the waves are. So we have nothing to tell us how high those waves are, except mariners. We rely very heavily on them for reports. Uh, we do have sensors at the reef, you know, at the lighthouses, some of them like Sombrero, Sand Key, Long Key, um, and the Molasses Reef. And the, but those only give us wind and water temperature and, and air temperature. They don't give us wave height. So we're really at a disadvantage and rely on these, these mariners to help us. The Key West Weather Service office uses a combination of tools to predict the weather. No one tool by itself would be sufficient. 
One such tool is the giant radar on Boca Chica. If you're on US-1 coming to Key West and passing Boca Chica on the golf side, you're going to see a giant golf ball that sits on top of a 60-foot pedestal. And that's our weather radar for the Keys. And that's probably a $5 million installation, and its whole purpose is to protect life and property in the Keys. Inside the giant golf ball on Boca Chica is a, is a large diameter radar dish. And this dish spins around inside the, the ball. And each time it spins, it tips up just a little farther. And it does this so that it tips up and takes what we call slices, and it gets about 15 slices inside of five minutes. And it's sending a pulse out and listening for it to come back. And it can tell by the change in frequency when it comes back what direction whatever it hit was moving. And the meteorologist can then look at that and tell what it hit, how, how big a rain droplets it was, and what direction they were moving. And then you can kind of start to guess uh, from that whether you've got circulation in the cloud, whether you've got a tornado or something that's going to support strong winds. The National Weather Service also funds about 180 balloon launch sites around the United States, the Pacific, and parts of the Caribbean. It is all part of a worldwide network of balloon launches that goes into a computer model which forecasters use to base their forecasts on. And what the balloon does is gives you a nice vertical profile. There's a sensor underneath the balloon and that sends back data. We can tell the wind direction and the pressure and temperature and relative humidity with height as that balloon goes up to sometimes up as high as 100,000 feet. And we do that twice a day. And in fact, today, we're going to start doing it four times a day because we've got two tropical systems in the neighborhood. And the computer models would like to have some more data. On top of this building is a, is a tracking antenna that will track the radio signal in that box. And it'll go up about 100,000 feet. And the balloon's going to start out about the size of a car. And when it gets up that high, because the air pressure up there is so small, it will have expanded to about the size of a house before it breaks. In addition to the high-tech balloons and the higher-tech radar dish, the Weather Service in Key West also relies on eyewitness reports from around the Keys. The Key West Weather Office has a network of storm spotters that they rely upon. These spotters are volunteers and often are the first line of defense in warning mariners about impending water spouts. The basic thing to remember about a water spout is they can damage your boat and they, they have 50, maybe 100 mile an hour wind in these things and you don't want to just take your boat right up to it to see what, it, what it's doing. Uh, they typically don't move during their life cycle and they, until the end and at the end they're going to move because what's going to happen is all that water that's, that's being pulled up is going to come down and when it comes down with that it's going to be a downburst and that's going to shift that spout one way or the other and so the spout's really going to move away from the rain so if you see the rain shaft behind the spout that spout may be coming right at you. In addition to moving away, observers should call the National Weather Service and report the water spout so that NOAA can alert the public. In the future, low-tech and high-tech will be joined by even higher tech. The National Weather Service is using cutting-edge computer technology to develop increasingly precise forecasts. Recently, the National Weather Service started something that they call the National Digital Forecast Database. And what that is, is the forecasters are now drawing the forecast on a screen. And the computer translates what they drew into a, a digitized database. And so they're doing it at such a high resolution that it's every four kilometers. So you, you put a box on a map, a four by four box, 
and you're going to get a value uh, in there every hour for the first 72 hours for wind temperature, relative humidity, if it's over water, the wave height. And this has never been done before. It's not being done in any other country. And it's something we're really proud of and pushing. Of course, the other big job of the Key West Weather Station happens between June and November each year, Hurricane Watch. When hurricanes approach, the Key West Station feeds data to another part of the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center in Miami, established to predict and research hurricane activity. But our role during the hurricane then becomes trying to take the track forecast and intensity forecast, translate that to where the worst storm surge is going to be, and we try to help um, emergency management decide when to start an evacuation, when to end an evacuation, when to pull their people back inside to safety, and where to send them after the, after the hurricane to rescue people. In the early 1990s, the National Weather Service considered closing the Key West office. With the advent of the internet and other amazing technologies, it seemed that the weather forecasts for the Florida Keys could be done from anywhere. Locals did not like this concept. The problem is forecasters don't do so good for areas they don't actually see. And the local population here being so weather dependent, um, both for their livelihood and their safety, really wrote their congressman and, and even wrote the president. We had support from the governor of Florida to keep this office open. And so we're still here today. In fact, they expanded the office. The Key West branch of the National Weather Service is soon to move offices from the airport to Old Town, Key West. However, this will not change the venues in which the weather forecasts can be seen and heard. Uh, you could get weather information from the NOAA Weather Radio, which is rebroadcast on cable channel 16 and sometimes cable channel 19 down here in the Keys. Um, you can also get it off our website and I would almost recommend that you get it off the website because you not only get somebody reading you the forecast like you would on the radio, but you get to read it yourself plus look at all the graphics like radar imagery and so forth. The weather service reports in the Keys can also be found on VHF channel 2, which is handy for those mariners without a weather radio. Wherever locals receive the information, one thing remains uniform the need for accurate and timely weather forecasts in the Florida Keys. While these forecasts may seem automatic and some may take it for granted, behind the scenes there is a constant bustle of activity. Thanks to the efforts of the men and women who relentlessly work 24 hours a day at the Key West Weather Station, the Keys will continue to be a safe and prosperous place for all its residents and visitors.